again and welcome once more to the Invisible College. And we're going to be doing something rather different uh, today. Uh, I've been doing a whole series on the ancient history of Britain and I think I've done eight or nine lectures on that subject and I think it's time now we did something a bit different. Uh, I'll come back to that in due course but uh, we're going to go into a new subject which is what's generally referred to as the electric universe or sometimes it's called a plasma universe. Those terms will become clear to you as we progress. Um, but it's a very, very exciting thing. And if this is taking us into the realm of um, astrophysics, actually. But don't worry, if you're not a scientist, it, it doesn't matter. You don't, you don't need to be. I'm going to show you uh, what this is all about and, and explain it in very simple ways. Because... As, as I think, um, who has it said? It was someone very famous said, if you can't explain your theory to your grandmother, it's not a good theory, or words to that effect. And I think that's true, you know. Um, real science actually is very, very simple at core. It might be difficult or complex when you have to start working out, um, I don't know, how to fire a rocket and put it into orbit. Um, you know, rocket science is rocket science, it's difficult. Um, but you don't need to go into that level of understanding to understand that a rocket has stuff blowing out of the bottom of it and it pushes it up um, and it can get into space and it can get into orbit. We can all understand that. So it's very much the same when we're dealing with paradigms. Um, we're dealing with... Uh, the whole way we view the world, which is what a paradigm is. And I'm going to introduce you to the ancient paradigms, or at least one of them, and then I'm going to take you to the contemporary paradigm, and then we're going to hint about where we're going to be going to look to develop a new paradigm, a new kind of physics, to explain the universe better than is being taught in our universities and in our colleges and on television and in the media and in all the textbooks. Everywhere you go, um, you're being taught something that's completely false and unprovable. So we're going to go down that road. So hang on tight, it's going to be good. So where are we here? So the Electric Universe, Introduction, Paradigm Shift, I've called this first lecture. Now, I wanted to show you this diagram. If those of you who have been um, following my lectures uh, on other subjects will have seen it before. It's a, a favourite diagram of mine. I come back to it again and again. And it was uh, an illustration from a major work by an Englishman called Robert Flood. Um, and he, he wrote a book which... Uh, it's called for short, The History of the Microcosm and Macrocosm. That's the English title. I won't go into the, <laughs> the Latin. It, it, it runs on for paragraphs. Um, but we can call it The History of the Mi Macrocosm and Microcosm, which was published in multiple volumes between 1617 to 1626. And I think there's actually seven volumes in all and there were intended to be more, at least two, maybe three more. So uh, he died before he could write those. So it's a major work and covers many different fields. But I think this diagram here um, is probably the most important one in all of his works. And I'm a great fan of Robert Flood. So Flood's diagram is essentially a model of the universe that is based on a paradigm. A paradigm is a, you could call that a collection of theories that hang together and make up uh, what in German they called a Weltanschauung, or world view. And the, the world view is kind of your take on the world. Um, if you're, uh, it, this very often has religious connotations actually. If you're a Christian, you have a certain world view, don't you? You have a, a view that this is... Um, the sort of fallen world that 
that uh, Jesus came to and had to die on the cross so we could be saved and we could go to a higher world called heaven. Um, obviously, if you're an atheist, you don't believe any of that. Uh, you don't believe that uh, there is a God for a start, an atheist without God. Uh, you believe everything you see around you is just uh, a result of random chance. It's random chance that this planet has life on it. Who knows how it came about, but once it's here, it uh, just evolves. You know, survival of the fittest, random mutation, all of that, carrying it along. Um, you know, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> uh, here we are. Here we are today in all our splendor and all our hopes and fears and uh, good and evil that we do. Well, that's a paradigm and that's a worldview that's shared by many people. Uh, it's quite different from the Christian worldview. A Buddhist would have a different worldview again and a Hindu. Um, and a scientist, uh, they have their worldview and we'll be coming to that shortly. So this particular worldview that Flood's giving us here is a vision of the universe that unites man with nature. The worlds of the planets, stars, angels and ultimately God himself. So you can see those, uh, I pointed out the tetragrammaton, and you can see those three outer rings with little angelic figures floating in them. Uh, they represent the three choirs of angels uh, in traditional Christianity. Um, the angels are arranged in choirs. There are nine orders of angels, supposedly, and there are sort of lower angels closer to the creation, and there are higher angels um, closer to God, you could say. Then below them, you can see sort of a dotted sphere um, going round there, uh, that represents the sphere of the fixed stars. And you have to understand that the ancients viewed the universe as all the stars that you see, the fixed stars, as being on the inside of a gigantic hollow sphere um, made of glass. And they are fixed on that sphere, and as that sphere moves, so they move with it. Um, they are little lights stuck on it. And they, that's, they, they call that the celestial, meaning heavenly sphere of the stars. And then underneath that, you have a number of concentric rings, which represented the sphere of the planets, or spheres. Each planet was thought of as being stuck on a, another hollow sphere, glassy sphere, and that planet moves with that sphere. Um, and they have slightly more complicated motions. Um, you know, they, sometimes they seem to be moving forwards, and other times we look at them, they seem to be moving backwards. Um, they go into a retrograde. We know now that's because the Earth is actually going round as well. They thought the Earth was at the middle of the centre of the universe, and everything else went round it. Uh, and, and because of that, they thought of things going retrograde, but we know that that's all to do with the Earth moving and catching up and overtaking. So I'm not going to go into that. You, you probably know it anyway. But there are seven different spheres of the planets. And you can, in the ancient view, take the Sun as being a planet. And Flood is, a, is using this uh, Earth-centered model of the universe because it fits better with the world view that he wants to get across to do that. He knows very well that the Earth goes around the Sun, in fact, but he's using this Earth-centered model because it, it's going to help him integrate together um, his worldview, the paradigm that he's working with. So you had seven uh, levels of the planets, and they're all shown there. Um, and you can see the Sun, and you can see the other planets there. And then below that, He's got the spheres of the minerals and he's got the other things. We'll come to those in, in due course. So we should also take note that Flood himself was writing at a very critical time in European history. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, he was writing after the publication of Bacon's 
of Francis Bacon's book, The Advancement of Learning. I think that came out in uh, 1605. And he was writing contemporaneously with uh, Bacon's other major works on the great instauration, such as Novum Organum. Now, Francis Bacon, I'm sure you've heard of. He was a uh, well, he was a Chancellor of England at one time for James I, but he was also a scientist or more of a philosopher of science. And his books are still worth reading today, uh, The Advancement of Learning, when he explains why science is important, why we need to be extending our knowledge, uh, pushing forwards. And he uses the um, image of explorers going out in their ships out to sea to find new lands, discover America. And actually one of the books he wrote was called The New Atlantis and he viewed America as being the New Atlantis, that they would create a new culture there, uh, a new civilization based on, on truth and science and, and knowledge and peace. <laughs> Has America lived up to it? I leave that for you to think about. But um, he was very much thinking in those terms and he was using the imagery of, I don't know, all those famous explorers, Columbus, Vasco Vasco da Gama, uh, Amerigo Vespucci and and others. And and of course, um, uh, our own Francis Drake, who sailed around the world. Um, So we we have the, uh, the idea of the... The bold mariner who goes out and he's not perturbed by the ocean. He doesn't think he's going to fall off the edge of a, a, a flat earth, uh, which has an edge and you can fall off it. He, he knows or certainly th- believes that it's a sphere and you can sail on round. And he's saying here that um, we have to take our, our courage and go out and find new knowledge. And that was very much um, uh, promoting the idea of science at a time when people were a bit scared, you know. Uh, Should we be doing this? Um, Are we actually doing something evil, finding out new knowledge? Maybe God doesn't want us to know all this. Uh, Maybe we shouldn't be doing that. It's magic. Keep away from it. Well, he was sort of settling people down, saying... We've got to find new knowledge. It's right that we should do so. We must push the bounds. We must uh, extend the range. And of course, that is what has characterised European civilization ever since. He was a prophet of this. He was a prophet of the Enlightenment, really, which uh, had its origins in this period. And there was was this period when Flood was writing between about 1617 to, I think, about 1626. Um, He wrote an immense amount during that time, (laughs) immense amount. Um, That was a a sort of interesting period. And then you had in the 1640s in England, you had the start of the Invisible College, the original Invisible College that I took the name from for what we're doing, because I feel that we're trying to do a kind of instauration as well. Um, The Invisible College had a number of the most famous scientists of their day um, who were members of that college, including people like Christopher Wren, uh, Robert Boyle, and there was was loads of others. Um, And then in 1661, it received a royal charter from the restored... King of England, Charles II, and it became the Royal Society, which still runs today. So the Royal Society has its roots way back in all of this, and and the Invisible College has its roots back with people like Flood and Francis Bacon, who were a generation or two earlier. So this sort of thing is very, very important, and we're still involved with the advancement of learning, or we should be, um, we're still um, drawing from the inspiration that uh, these early, what well, let's call them, they, they call themselves natural philosophers at the time. That, that's what scientists were called then. So let's draw some inspiration from them and understand that they weren't just 
trying to work out um, how much you can stretch a spring before it breaks or uh, how much light is bent by a prism. Those kind of early physics uh, experiments that were being done were very important. But you also had to develop a world view and understand within the context of the whole. And people like Flood uh, were developing this world view that stretched from the macrocosm to the microcosm. The macrocosm means the greater universe, macro, great, cosm, cosmos. The greater cosmos is the universe. And it has within it lesser cosmoses. The, the solar system is a cosmos within the greater cosmos. It's a, a unity of itself. Just as you have the greater cosmos of your body, uh, you know, your, cos your, your body is a cosmos, but each um, organ in your body is a microcosmos within that body. Just like the planets are microcosmos, cosmic, would that be right? Cosme, yeah, or cosmoses um, within the solar system. So you have these idea of these uh, cosmoses within cosmoses within cosmoses. And just as the individual cells of your body are microcosmoses themselves um, at the lowest level, uh, you, know, you have cells in each of your organs and everything in your body is composed of cells. So you have this idea of the unity between the larger and the smaller and how they interact with one another. Um, and that's kind of what was being developed here in Flood's diagram. So these works, that's Francis Bacon's works, opened the door for what we now call science as a means of extending knowledge into new fields of learning unknown to our ancestors. This would, in time, lead to what we now call the Enlightenment. Enlightenment, bringing light, light into, <laughs> into the subjects, turning on the light. Enlightenment, when I come into this room and if it's dark, I turn on the light and it's enlightened. So that's what they were trying to do. The Enlightenment within the mind, particularly, uh, is, is what they were leading towards. Now that's gone off in a very weird tangent in you know the last century or so, but nonetheless that was what they were trying to do. So Flood's, di Flood's work, summed up by this diagram, can be seen as a bold attempt to restate the comprehensive view of the world as a unified system at a time when science was already moving in the opposite direction. So science has this tendency to atomize. What do I mean by that? Well, you have, um, uh, let's take medicine, for example. You have the idea of originally that a doctor, yeah, a doctor was someone who treated patients, treated the body, like a general practitioner. But then you, you ended up with people who are specialising. They're specialising, well, I'm a heart doctor, I'm a kidney doctor, I'm a lungs doctor, I'm a, a guts doctor, or a brain, I'm a brain surgeon. They, it atomizes, And this happens in all of the sciences, that um, everything starts to get narrower and narrower and narrower. And um, <laughs> I've heard it put this way, that a generalist is someone who knows nothing about everything. And a specialist is someone who knows everything about nothing. Uh, <laughs> these are the two poles. And somehow we have to find a way of keeping the general view while maybe specialising into a certain subject area. And the, the trouble with science is everybody, all the, they're all specialists in their own area. And they assume that other people have got everything worked out properly in their areas. So they don't need to think about that. Um, they can get on with their, their bit of science that they're doing. And it'll all be all right, the overall view. But the problem is that they haven't got it right. And particularly not with astrophysics. And we're going to look at that now as to what's happened and why we need to be thinking again about the electric universe. 
Now, here we can see um, a detail from Flood's diagram. And the Latin at the top there, you can see the tetragrammaton I was talking about the, in the middle there, the, the, word, the name of God uh, illuminating everything. And it says, Integre nature speculum artisque imago. And that translates into English as the mirror of the whole of nature and the image of art. Right? So we're going to look at that a little bit. Speculum means mirror in Latin. Yeah, a speculum. And they had mirrors, you know, in the ancient world. Even in the sort of Bronze Age, they had mirrors. You would have a metal plate polished up highly. And you could look in it and you could see yourself. Um, you know, and, and they had, you know, as ladies' hand mirrors. They would comb their hair, look in the mirror, just as you might do. They weren't as good as our mirrors. We were learned how to deposit silver on, on flat glass plate and put that in a uh, some kind of mirror, you know, thing to hold it so it doesn't get scratched. And we got very good mirrors, but they had mirrors. They'd probably have to polish them regularly, but they would work. So the me root meaning of speculation means looking into a mirror. Have you thought about that? When you say he's speculating, he's looking into a mirror. Yeah, <laughs> speculation. A speculation is a reflection of some, of an image, and the mirror he's actually looking into is the mind. The mind is thought to mirror things, and it creates images. Uh, imago is an image, and that's the root meaning of our word imag imagination. Imago, creating an image. So the speculation is based on the image in the mind. You create the, through your imagination, you create an image, uh, a specula, a, a, you know, a reflection, an imago, in the, uh, as a speculation, as a, a looking in the mirror. So you're looking into your mind to see an image of reality. That's what it's all about. So when you're creating a, a mental image of something, that's what you're doing. You're speculating. Does that make sense? I hope so. But it's something to think about. So in this diagram is the art of speculating and creating an imaginary image of the world, i.e. a model. So what Flood has done, he's, he's used his mind to create an image of all and everything, from God down to the world that we see around us, the world of nature, um, integrated together into the whole thing. Um, and that gives them a world model, a model of the universe. Now we see in the middle of his diagram, Mother Nature, and we know it's her, um, because she turns up in all sorts of places. Now you see here, she has a chain linking her wrist. If I go back up here, you can see the top of the chain with a little hand coming out from the cloud of God holding that chain. And it goes down to her hand. And that is the golden chain. It's actually the Logos stream is what it's talking about. For those of you who have been following my work in other areas, um, that's what we're talking about. And Mother Nature, uh, you can see the milk coming out from her breast, uh, is feeding the whole of nature. So nature feeds life on earth. Um, you know, there would be no life on earth if nature didn't feed everything. Everything eats everything else. <laughs> on this planet. That's how it works. You know, it, actually, it's a huge transformation machine. Um, the sunlight comes down and feeds the grass and feeds the trees and feeds the plants. And then other things come along and eat it. The rabbits come along and then something, the fox eats the rabbit. So everything feeds off everything else, but it's all actually parts and parcel of nature. So she's feeding the world. And you can see her holding a chain with her other hand, 
passing on the chain and that goes down to man uh, you'll see him in a minute so you can see here um, the various elements shown you can see uh, elementum aquae et terrem terre uh, element of water and of land or earth there at the top there um, at, down the bottom here you can see elements of air and fire it says elementum aeris elementum ignis so the elements of air and fire now you have to understand that people like flood were very much involved with alchemy or alchemical thoughts and the alchemical thoughts were derived very much from the hermetic teachings which come originally from Egypt uh, Egypt, one name for Egypt was Al-Chem, you know, the, the Chem, 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 or Chemi, referred to the Delta area of Egypt. So al chem was the Egyptian science, the Egyptian thing. The Egyptians were well known for their skill in alchemy, in, in not just um, playing around with metals and mixing, making amalgams and all of that, but also taking essences of plants and making medicines out of them, uh, all, all that sort of thing. What we would now call chemistry, which comes from the same root, alchemy. Now, they believed from the Hermetica that when God created everything, he spat out or ejaculated uh, matter into the universe as a lump, a, a, a buzzing mixture and then the solid, the earth and uh, water elements moved downwards. They call them downward tending. And they often represent that with a downward pointing triangle pulling downwards. While the air and fire would move upwards. They were an upward pointing triangle. So you had the earth and you had the water pulled down and the air floating upwards and above it the fire. I'll be coming to that later on as we progress. Now we can see here also we have the mineral world, the vegetable world and the animal world. So there's our understanding that the, within nature there are these different kingdoms. You know, we call them the mineral kingdom, the animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom. Um, you could say the human kingdom is um, the world above that. And we see here man as the intelligent ape trying to understand with his sciences. Now I've talked a lot about this in other lectures. I'm not going to go into this particularly hard here. But man is represented as the intelligent ape. Uh, there he is sitting on the planet in the middle there. And he's holding up a ball which represents the planet actually. And he's trying to measure it with a pair of dividers or something. He's looking at it. That's... He is man the scientist, trying to understand where he is, what this world is all about. You know, he's, he's intent in what he's doing, but nature has him on a chain, so he's like a performing monkey. <laughs> so it's a bit of humour here, you know. What do we think we are, we, these uh, intelligent apes who, who don't understand anything? Like, oh, what's all this all about? Um, well, if they opened their eyes and looked around them more, they would understand better, perhaps, um, what's going on. They need to use the mind, yes, and the, the speculate, and using the imagination, and they might get further. Now then, this is another view, um, uh, taken from a book called Atalanta Fugiens, um, by Michael Mayer. Uh, it's published around about the same time as uh, the books of Flood. And it shows Mother Nature, she's walking along um, and she's holding her flowers and her vegetables in, in each hand. And following behind her is the image of the true scientist. He follows in her footsteps. And to do that, he needs a lamp, the lamp of his intelligence, intuition. You know, and he needs his glasses on. He's got his glasses on so he can see clearly. And he's walking along and he's walking in her footsteps. 
So the true scientist has to follow nature, he has to follow nature's footsteps. So what does this mean? It means that if you want to be a true scientist, you carry out experiments within the context of the physical world, physics, physical. You want to understand the laws of nature, the laws governing nature. And that can be everything from chemical equations, uh, it can be how light is bent by prisms and, and lenses, it can be how steam engines work by the expansion of gases. There's all these things, but they are very physical and they are to do with reality. Um, Mother Nature does things in a real way and we need to understand her methods and methodology so that we will find the correct answers. So it's one thing to speculate with your mind and you create images, but if those images are just imaginary, if they're only you know, images in the mind, they're not rooted or connected to actual reality, then they're, they're no, of no purpose. They can be fun. They can be, uh, you know, uh, you, you can draw cartoons, you can uh, invent strange sci-fi worlds that don't really exist, governed by laws that we've never seen in operation. Uh, you know, your starship can have um, a super-duper drive that makes it go f so much faster than the speed of light, you almost instantaneously cross the whole, whole universe. You can do that in your imagination. But is it real? Well, probably not. Um, you know, but we play with those ideas when we are dealing with science fiction. And the word is fiction, not faction. If we're dealing with science faction, then we, we've got to uh, do things in ways that obey the laws of physics. So, so you have Elon Musk with his gigantic starship. Um, he has to obey the laws of physics. If he doesn't, it's just going to go up and blow up. And he hasn't managed to get, get it just right, the engineering right. He knows what he's trying to do, and he knows the basic concepts that need to be followed and obeyed, the laws. But it's a question of getting the engineering right now so that the physical thing will actually work. So it's one thing to um, make yourself an aeroplane. Uh, you know, it's another thing to make one that actually flies. Uh, <laughs> it's as simple as that. You've got to obey the laws of nature and you follow in her footsteps to do that. So, to summarise, the speculating image created for the whole of the world includes all and everything. It stretches from the realm of God himself, as the Tetragrammaton, down through the angelic spheres, the starry spheres, the planetary spheres, the elements and then nature. It defines man's place in the universe as a creature held captive like a pet monkey by Mother Nature. That's our situation. Yeah? Get used to it. That's your situation. Uh, in, you're not going to, you know, certainly not very easily are you going to be able to go and live on Mars. You're not, I promise you. <laughs> um, and man is on her lead, but she is herself on God's lead. All is connected. So that's uh, the worldview of Robert Flood. I think it's a good one. And now I'm going to take you into another worldview, the contemporary worldview, for how modern science, modern astrophysics, looks at the world. And it starts off going bang! Yes, the big bang. Notice that the Big Bang theory is also a speculative image of the whole of nature. Yeah, just like Flood's image, uh, only it's got a lot of things missing, isn't it? Um, the speculation dispenses with God as a plausible creator of all that exists. So there's no God there. God's gone. God, you know, 
God has died, like Nietzsche, Nietzsche murdered him, or Marx murdered him, or someone murdered him, um, not around anymore, not needed, dispensed with, um, so there's no God there. Um, instead, it postulates that the universe is sui generis, that means uh, generated out of itself, of self-generation, coming out of a massive explosion when all and everything was created all at once in an infinitesimally short time. So you've said this presented to you. You must have seen this on television. It's in all the books. It's in the textbooks. It's what you're taught if you go to university, probably primary school these days. Um, big Bang. It leaves the question, what was happening before the Big Bang? And that's a, mm, don't go there. <laughs> situation uh, but, but they'll tell you exactly when it happened this is what i find most extraordinary um it says here uh big bang expansion 13.77 billion years so all the way from the, the infinitesimally moment of creation bang uh to now is 13.77 billion years how do they know how how has how has this worked out? Um, well, we have our ways, you know. We're scientists. We, we we understand these things. Don't worry. We know it's there. Uh, well, I do worry. I worry very much. It's it's not to me a plausible explanation. Um, it's full of holes. It's, it it seems to me that someone is pulling the wool over my eyes. That's what it seems to me. Now. According to the standard model, that's what they call the standard model of astronomy these days. Uh, it's not like it was in the days when um, uh, Flood was writing, and the days when they believed that stars were lights, and that each light had an intelligence. There was a, an angel living in each planet, and each star was uh, actually, that was the body of an angel. Uh, you know, the these... Uh, angelic spheres and so on, they're all inhabiting stars or lights around the throne of God. That's how they viewed things. Well, we don't have that anymore. Um, we have the idea of the, these stars are just inanimate lumps of matter. Well, they're not even lumps, so they call them gas, gas clouds, clouds of hydrogen. So according to the standard model, Stars are formed when clouds of hydrogen gas condense under the pull of gravity. So gravity is pulling in this stuff, this hydrogen, this cloud, it's all clumping together to make a, a star and, then, and it presses in on itself and it comes to the point when the ball of gas gets more and more dense until a point is reached when the hydrogen begins to turn into helium. Huh? Yes, yes, when it's pushed together by all this gravity, it's pushed so hard, the atoms of hydrogen begin to push together and stick together to make helium. So um, we have a nuclear reaction happening. In essence, every star is a hydrogen bomb. That's how hydrogen bombs work. So we have stellar evolution. So they have then these ideas about how stars develop once they've, they've been formed. And they have uh, low and medium mass stars, including the sun. Oh, our sun is a main sequence medium mass star. So it starts off, and it, it goes, becomes a yellow star there. You can see moving to the right, will grow up and become a red giant. And then the red giant will form a planetary nebula and end up as a white dwarf. Oh, well, that's a bit odd. So it's going to go through... Uh, nobody's actually seen a star doing this. There are all these different kinds of stars. So they, they work out, well, that must have at one time been like that. It, 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 it wasn't always a red giant. It was more like our sun is. And they see another thing with a, a planetary nebula, you know, a round disk of something. Uh, 
uh, well, that, that's what the red giant will turn into. And they see a white dwarf, a very small star, what's left over when it's gone through all that process. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's what it will end up as. Ah, well, that's one theory. Then they have the other kind of high mass stars, which um, form a, a, a giant white star to begin with, and that turns into a red supergiant, something like Betelgeuse, you know. And then they say, well, you know, that because there's so much more there, it's going to be, become a supernova, and uh, it will throw out a neut a what, neutron star. Come on, uh, you know, as far as I know, neutrons don't exist for more than a, a millisecond outside of the atom, um, or even less. Um, but these are supposed to be stars actually made from neutrons. Huh? That's another mm, weird thing. Or it can end up with a black, uh, black hole, black hole. Um, yeah, 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 black hole. Well, we're going to come to that black hole business in a minute. But that's how they, they tell us everything is. Now, how are they deciding this? Have they flown up there and gone to some of these stars and carried out experiments? No, no. All they have is telescopes that can take in light of various frequencies. When I say light, that includes radio waves, microwaves, uh, ultraviolets, x-rays, gamma rays, the whole spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. We've got instruments that can measure pretty much all of that now. So they point these things, and maybe throw a telescope up into the sky, you know, a Hubble or something. They can point that at the stars without interference from the atmosphere. That's great. But even so, all you're looking, doing is taking photographs of something a very long distance away very, very long distance away. And you're making all these suppositions. You're creating these imaginary models of the universe. You're creating these images in your mind to explain what you're seeing. But very often, all you're doing is you, you're making one model and then you're building another model based on that model. You're not actually following in the footsteps of nature because you can't. <laughs> Nature doesn't work that way. Um, you can't do proper experiments to prove or disprove your theory. So you're free to theorize about whatever you like. You know, you can say there's Father Christmas up there. Yeah, for real. Father Christmas is up there in Beetlejuice. Um, well, you know, someone says, well, how can you prove it? Well, I can't prove it, but, you know, I know he's there. You, you disprove it. You can't disprove it either, can you? So there's all these different ideas that actually can't be proved, but they can't be disproved either because you can't do proper science on them. This is the problem with modern astrophysics. So the stars we see in the, the sky are just so many bonfires in space, each burning up its hydrogen to make helium. Other than gravity, they have no connection with one another. They're simply islands in space. So that's the model of the universe that we're given by modern astrophysics. It's what's called the islands in space. All these bonfires up there burning away with their hydrogen, you know, clouds of hydrogen turning into helium. All, each one, they've all managed to find this way of pulling in the hydrogen igniting and turning into, into helium and getting planets to go around. You know, most of them seem to have planets now, having planets going around them, and it's all very mysterious. But, you know, that's how it is. Um, get used to it. There are all these rocks in space and islands in space. That's, what, that's, that's the universe you live in. Aren't you lucky you live on Earth? You have some air to breathe. You wouldn't do up there. Um, that's, that's the model of the universe that we've been given. And we have a solar system. There we see it, our star, the sun, and we have all these different planets going round. And we're told that 
when, when the sun was condensing all this gas to make the hydrogen and, and, and start, start off, there was some left over, a bit of bits left over. And that, those, they conglomerated into planets going around the sun. So that's how we all have these planets. Why some are big and some are small? Well, you know, probably they're just in the right place to be big. Well, you know, I know it's a bit awkward that we're seeing stars that seem to have some super giant planets right up close, so close that they're closer than Mercury is to our sun and they're whipping around at an incredible rate. Um, well, you know, we don't know everything. <laughs> they were telling us till very recently, as I see these comets there, they were telling us till very recently that comets were dirty snowballs. Do you remember that? Oh yes, the comets, they come from the Oort cloud or somewhere out there and they come in and as they come into the solar system they come nearer and nearer and they start to melt and they get a tail from the melted ice, the, these dirty snowballs and they come in and then they go out they come around the sun and the dirty snowball uh, goes out again. Well, um, there's several things wrong with that. First of all, it's damn cold out around Jupiter, <laughs> you know, out, way out there. Um, how is that ice melt be, meant to be melting when the temperatures out, out there are probably something like minus 250 degrees centigrade? Um, it's not going to happen, is it? Um, maybe if they were really close to the sun, but they're not. They, we start seeing their tails when they're way out. And then when they put probes up there, very clever people, sort of Elon Musk types, can get rockets and they, they, they do know their, their rocket science. And they can launch rockets, will actually rendezvous with a comet and even land on it. Um, and each time they've done this, and they've done it quite a few times now, they found these comets are rocky bodies. They're not made of ice. They're much more like asteroids. In fact, they're almost identical to asteroids, except they have very elliptical orbits that take them right out of the solar system. So you don't hear so much about this um, dirty snowball idea anymore because science has disproven it. Yeah? They've actually been able to do an experiment to send a spaceship, or more than one, to these comets, and they meet them, and they find other odd things, that very often these comets are sort of dumbbell-shaped. Um, why is that? And they seem to have stratification of rocks, um, just like cliff faces on them, <laughs> and a lot of sand. I mean, it's very, very odd. It doesn't fit the dirty snowball image at all. It looks much more like debris, from a planet that has exploded at some time or other. But that's a taboo subject. You're not allowed to say that. Um, so they don't. Um, but that's what it actually looks like. The planets, too, are just random bodies formed from the remnants of the hydrogen and other gases at the time when their star was coming into being. Like everything else in the universe, they have no purpose. They're just there. So this is the other thing about this model. The earlier model we saw, Flood's model, everything has a purpose. It's all purpose set out by God. God's at the top there. He's pulling the chain and he's, he's in charge. They have nobody in charge. Nothing's in charge. All the big bang, all random stuff gone out, all random bonfires, all random planets. There's no purpose to anything. It's just there. So there's no responsibility. There's, there can be no real morality in an, a universe which is just a random mechanism. Not even a mechanism, it's just a thing, just a, an object uh, that just is. That is the contemporary atheistic view of the universe that's taken over from the mac macrocosm, microcosm view of people like Flood. Now, I'm going to take you, in, we're going to lighten the mood a bit. We're going to talk about um, a TV series called The Big Bang Theory, which I think was lampooning this view. Initially, that's what it was meant to do. It moved away from that, but that's what it was meant to do. So we're going to discuss The Big Bang Theory from the point of view of Hollywood. <laughs> So the Big Bang Theory is a comedy series. 
At its centre is the relationship between the two main characters. There's an experimental physicist, Leonard, shown on here on the right in an orange t-shirt, and his taller flatmate, Sheldon. Right. So these are the two uh, principal characters in the series. Now, if you analyse the series carefully, it's clear that as it was originally devised, the character of Leonard Hofstadt, Hofstadter <laughs> was intended to be the protagonist. A protagonist is the hero, the, the person whose journey, whose path in any movie we're following. The most, mostly we're looking through his eyes, it's his adventure. Here's the first character we meet, and the main arc of development was intended to be his journey from geekiness to full maturity in the world, as well as of the laboratory. So he's an experimental scientist. Thus, he is the one that courts and eventually wins the heart of the main love interest of the series, the girl next door, called Penny. He is also a top-rated experimental physicist with a PhD working on lasers. So he's a clever guy. Um, he plays the cello. He's a pretty geeky, as they all are, um, particularly at the start. But he he's, has the gumption and he has the um, willingness to actually overcome his fears and court the girl. And eventually in the series, I don't want to spoil it too much for you, but he wins the girl, um, Penny, who is com from a completely different world. <laughs> completely different. Uh, Leonard's antagonist was surely intended to be Sheldon Cooper. Although they are flatmates, Sheldon sets the rules. He, uh, yeah, he's a bully, actually. Um, he is clearly on the spectrum. You know, he's very autistic, but regards himself and requires everyone around him to agree that he is so intelligent he's worthy of a Nobel Prize. So he's a narcissist, He's uh, on the spectrum, as I said. He has no regard for other people's feelings. He doesn't understand human feelings at all. He's almost like an alien who's landed on this planet who doesn't fit here. He doesn't understand it whatsoever, anything about um, human relationships. And he has to learn that. Um, he does a bit as he progresses. But Sheldon's work, if you can call it that, is in the field of theoretical physics, which essentially means mathematics. Um, he looks down his nose at his friends who engage in practical sciences, such as experimental physics, biology or chemistry, or even worse, engineering. So he himself is a theoretician. Yeah? He doesn't have got time to get his hands dirty doing experiments. That's for lesser mortals. Uh, he is there, he's up with the gods, he's, he's thinking great thoughts. He is uh, creating this whole imaginary world. Um, and he's, he knows that he, he's, he's too intelligent for these lesser people around him. Um, but his intelligence is such that he knows that he will one day win a Nobel Prize for the wonderful things he's done, uh, just like Einstein did. Uh, that's that's the, the uh, how he's presented at first, and he is the antagonist to Leonard because he's he's very hard to live with. He works out rule books. He demands that he has a particular place on the sofa that he sits. Nobody else is allowed to sit there. Only him. Um, he sets the rules about what food, takeaway food, they're going to have for each day. All this kind of thing. Yeah, he's insufferable, and you wonder how anyone would ha want to have anything to do with him. But Leonard puts up with him, and he doesn't understand that real science is all about following the footsteps of nature, not inventing untestable theories whose only validation, if you can call it that, is computer modelling. So you can set up a computer model to do anything. Um, the real test is how nature behaves. 
If I want to know about um, uh, gravity, I can do like Leonardo, uh, not Leonardo, Galileo, go up the Leaning Tower of Pisa and drop two objects, one heavier than the other, and discover that they both hit the ground at exactly the same time. That teaches me something about the laws of nature. Um, you can carry out all sorts of experiments here on Earth that teach you about the laws of, of uh, motion, uh, the, you know, the, the laws to do with the way gases expand, all these different things that we've de developed. And all our technology, our engineering, is based on that. If you don't follow the laws of nature with engineering, you very quickly come a cropper. So the engineers are actually very advanced people, but he looks down his nose at engineers because he thinks they're lesser mortals. I believe that the series was meant to lampoon the arrogance of theoretical physicists and their pretensions. Sheldon is incapable of doing experiments to prove or disprove his theories. He's not a, th a scientist, but a mathematician. He's very good at maths. Mathematics is really a language. In the right hands, it can be used to describe and explain scientific thoughts. And I think this is important too. Some of you may have seen the uh, poem Jabberwocky. All the words there, they're almost English in this poem, um, but they're not real words, so you, you don't really know what it, it means. It, it, it's jumble. It's jabberwock. Well, that can be done with maths, advanced maths. If you're not careful, you can create things or ideas that have no physical use at all. They have no application. And if your model of the universe is defective, then they're not going to work. Sheldon is also childish. He still reads comic books. Actually, Leonard does too, but not as much. And he loves dressing up as a superhero when given the chance. He lives in a twilight world of make-believe. He is a man-child who thinks science is just another toy to be played with mentally. And he wants to be patted on the back, I could add, um, for how clever he is. And that's why he wants the Nobel Prize. He wants the affirmation. Very quickly, the dynamics of the show changed from a lampoon to a celebration. The Sheldon character has so much potential for the show writers to play with that he soon overshadowed the original protagonist, Leonard. To reinforce the Leonard character so that he could retain relevance, it was necessary to build up the other male characters and later to add more women to the mix. That's Penny in the middle, by the way. The Big Bang Theory morphed from a lampoon on the pomposity of theoretical physics to being Friends. That's another comedy show. You've probably seen Friends. Um, uh, six friends in New York and they go to the coffee bar together and have adventures together. Uh, friends in LA instead of New York. In this, it was spectacularly successful and deservedly so. It was a very entertaining comedy. A real-life theoretical physicist, and therefore a Sheldon equivalent, was Stephen Hawking. He appeared in at least one episode of the comedy, I think actually more than one, and his voice was often mimicked in others. Hawking, who died in 2018, is best remembered for two things. His work promoting the concept of black holes and the fact that he was so incapacitated by motor neurone disease that he could only talk through a computer-simulated voice. He was also paralysed, and he was in a wheelchair all the time, and, and only this computer voice he could just about, um, I'm going to say type, but put, put words onto a computer screen and get the computer to voice it, text-to-speech in a sort of computer voice. Uh, a terrible situation to be in. I mean, I, I feel terribly sorry for the guy. Uh, it must have been a real penance, a hardship. So anyway, the Sheldon character was to a large extent based on Stephen Hawking. However, 
he was socially handicapped instead of being physically. Hawking, who clearly loved the show, played along with this. I think that deep down he recognised that much of his own work was playing with ideas that can never be scientifically proven. There was more than a little of the Sheldon in him. Um, because they couldn't be proven, uh, I've, I've read it said that uh, that's why he didn't get a Nobel Prize, Stephen Hawking. Everyone was uh, loved his work and they talked about black holes and he wrote a best-selling book and, uh, you know, he's a major, major figure. Um, but they couldn't be proven and so he didn't get a Nobel Prize. So Hawking is most famous for promoting and extending the theoretical concept of black holes. The concept of a black hole, something so gravitationally powerful that it sucks everything into it, even light, caught the public's imagination. Yeah, it, we've all heard about these black holes of they suck everything in, nothing can get out. Even light's drawn into the black, that's why they're black, because nothing can get out, no light can get out. Black holes became the regular feature in sci-fi films, and so entered the vernacular. Hawking himself extended the concept to absurd proportions, and I'm sure he knew he was. The original Einstein, yeah, Einstein came up with black holes, or the original black hole. Um, the original Einstein equation provided for one, only one, singularity at the beginning of time. So we're back to the Big Bang, before the Big Bang, there had to be the black hole, the singularity with everything set to zero in, in Einstein's equations. But suddenly we find black holes cropping up everywhere. Um, Hawking's universe had black holes where they were needed to balance the theoretical equations. So he believes there's a black hole in the centre of the galaxy. So that's why everything goes around it. You know, when a star collapses... And, the major star becomes a black hole, and that's there could be black holes floating around in the universe. We don't know where they are. Oh, our sun might collide with a black hole. We'll all be sucked in. <laughs> these kind of ideas, these notions, are just thought experiments, thought ideas. They belong in the realm of sci-fi, but they don't really belong in the realm of science faction. Black holes are not the only mathematical phantoms to haunt the universe of contemporary theoretical physics. Equally weird are dark energy and dark matter. I'll talk about them in other lectures. These cannot be seen or measured, but are assumed to be, a real, to be real simply because the equations will not work without them. So when they find they, they're trying to measure the, the rate of motion of a galaxy... Uh, they can work out how fast it's going round and round. You know, galaxies are rotating. Um, why don't they, the arms drift off, you know, f flung out with a centrifugal force? There must be a, a force pulling them in. But there's not enough matter there to do that, you know, in the stars that we see in the galaxy. So, ah, oh, there must be dark matter. That's what it is. You can't see it, you can't measure it, you can't touch it, but it must be there because they're not flowing. So this is what we call a fudge factor, put into the equations to make the model work. It, it's, it's cheating, it's cheating, but because nobody can go and, and, and search for it, well, you won't find it anyway because it's dark, isn't it? It's, it's, it's not like ordinary, you, 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 there's no light coming off it, there's nothing, but it's there, it's, it's pulling in. But you can't see it, you can't do it. It's cheating, but they do it and they get away with it. And the same with uh, dark energy, things moving much faster or accelerating when they shouldn't be. Um, there must be that dark energy. And we end up with the crazy idea that over 95% of the physical universe is composed of stuff, and that includes black holes, we can not, cannot see, measure, or comprehend. <laughs> In this theoretical universe, 95% is fairy dust, 
and the only 5% is ordinary matter or energy. And that's not a cosmology you can work with. You know, if everything is invisible, um, you know, that's like saying, well, it's all in the fairy world, isn't it? Uh, you, yeah, you can't see the fairies, but they're there. <laughs> um, Don Scott had a nice uh, way of putting this, Dr. Don Scott. Uh, he said, uh, imagine you go to bed, your garden furniture's outside there, and you wake up in the morning and you see it's blown, it's, it's down the bottom of the garden. And you say, well, yeah, the fairies put it there, didn't they? Um, well, you know damn well it, it wasn't. It was a storm. A storm blew it away. But that's what they're doing. They're using fairies, the equivalent, dark energy and dark matter, to explain things that should be explained in terms of physical concepts, real physics, not bogus figure, physics. The root cause of the problem is that astrophysicists have forgotten that the strong force at play in the universe is not gravity, but rather electricity. Huh? How strong? Well, the electric force between charged particles is 10 to the power of 39 times as strong as the gravitational force. So think about that. You have two particles. Yeah? Particle A, that might be an electron. Particle B might be a proton. There's a certain gravitational force between those, but there's also an electrical force. And the electrical force is 10 to the 39 times as strong as the gravitational force. Um, that's not 39 times as strong. It's one with 39 zeros after it times as strong. So it's a billion, 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 however many billions and millions you need for all those zeros, times as strong. In other words, gravity is irrelevant where the, where the strong force is concerned. Um, now then, a serious critic of the standard model, that's the Big Bang Theory model, which includes all the invisible entities such as black holes, dark matter and dark energy, was Wallace Thornhill, an Australian physicist he was a lovely man. Yeah, I miss him. He came to this house. We had dinner together. We had lots of chats. And that was when I was doing a, a, the Electric Universe conference in Bath, and he was one of the guest speakers. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet him in 2018 and had the opportunity to discuss his ideas with him personally. He gave me a copy of his book on the Electric Universe, co-authored with David Talbot. And here it is. That's his book. And I'm going to read out to you um, the first page. It has been said that the greatest ob obstacle to discovery is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. Too often the things we think we know obstruct the things we need to learn. In the 20th century, the luminaries of theoretical science forged a picture of the universe that seemed somehow complete and inarguable from subatomic physics to the life sciences, from planetary science to astronomy, astrophysics and cosmology, the big picture of the natural world left little room for doubt, or so it seemed. Today's popular cosmology stirs public imagination with weird and wonderful possibilities, all based on mathematics far beyond the interest or comprehension of most mortals. Working forward from a conjectured primordial state, the theorists would have us believe that they have solved the primary riddle of this cosmos, that they are on the verge of completing a theory of everything. We, that's uh, himself and uh, other scientists like him, we believe otherwise. Modern theory is not impregnable, and all is not well in the sciences. Space age engineers have indeed achieved unprecedented advances and theoreticians are basked in the resultant, um, in the resultant uh, glow of public attention. But in this environment, a decades-old scientific myth throws into dogma 
that progressively excluded uncomfortable facts and counter-arguments. By the end of the 20th century, the illusion became reality and the voices of critics, present in considerable numbers, were no longer heard. It will be up to historians of science to show how this occurred. To make our case, we need only consider discoveries readily accessible to working scientists and to all who have remained sceptical in the face of supposedly settled questions. As we intend to show, the fundamental mistake of standard cosmology is its dismissal of electricity as a significant factor in space. Devotion to an electrically neutral, gravity-driven universe has turned cosmology into a playground for mathematicians. And this turn of events was possible only because today's cosmologists lack the training to see the most compelling message of the space age, that we live in an electric universe. Now, I'm going to add just one last thing to that, and that is, you remember, in that other diagram I was showing you, um, that we had the downward-tending matter, earth and water, and we had the upward-tending, the air and fire. Well, that fourth element, fire, is actually what we would now call electricity or plasma. Plasma is matter in the state of fire when the electrons and the, uh, the, the rest of the atom become separate. And it's governed by a different kind of physics from air. It's governed by plasma physics. And we see this uh, with diagrams like this. This is, this is uh, the, the Hubble telescope and the James Webb telescope are revealing to us now all sorts of things in the universe we would never have thought of before, these incredible devices. They can't be explained as explosions or bangs or winds or anything. They can be explained by plasma physics, and we're going to get into that. So the electric universe is a blanket term used to describe a new and emergent paradigm, and I'm sure we will eventually replace the standard model. It factors into the equations what has been missing for far too long, the relevance of the electric force and the overwhelming determinant in how the physical universe is made and functions. In this series of lectures, we're going to dive deeply into this subject in a systematic way. You'll then have a proper framework for further discussion as the new paradigm evolves. So that's my intention with these series of lectures. I've been following this for some years now, and I've met many of the uh, major figures in developing this new paradigm. So I know um, that they would be pleased. And unfortunately, many of them, like uh, Wall himself, have passed on now, but um, it's important that their message is not lost that we carry on the work, and that work then carries on to future generations, younger generations, um, so that we get a proper model of the universe again. Um, I would argue with remembering God, but we need to have a proper understanding of what greater nature, the macrocosm, is all about. So thank you if you've managed to come all this way with me. And please, if you enjoyed this, give it a like. And if you're not already following the channel, please consider doing that. You know the score. Press the button, little bell, all that. Um, and you might even consider becoming a patron uh, through patreon.com. Um, patreon.com forward slash Adrian G. Gilbert. I'll put it in the box below. So thank you very much, and we'll meet again. Bye-bye.